Now on to we begin a new series, Windmill, introduced by Chris Searle. Hello and welcome to the first in our brand new series, Windmill. For the next few weeks, I'll be taking a weekly wander through some of the wonderful miles and miles of film and videotape carefully stashed away in the vaults of the BBC's Windmill Road Library. We start exactly where you are now, very probably, at home. We've found some houses and crazy things that go on inside them that you wouldn't see down your road in a month of Sundays. For example, have you noticed how much people care for the homes they live in? We'll visit a town of seaside holiday chalets which the owners have turned into miniature palaces. We'll relive some of the elegant hammering and sawing of television's original do-it-yourself man, Barry Bucknell. This is, as I said, a, a very rigid structure when you've just got it as far as that. And we'll see Paddington Bear having a crack at it, too. There's a small pack of pampered Pomeranians whose luxury life makes most humans' homes look like dog kennels. In the house, they have their own little room and beds, which, which they go into. And then what happens when your building loses its appeal? Just insert the dynamite and... You'll have to wait till later for the whole explosive story. Homes are for sharing, and our guest today is the lady star of a series all about a home for two. I wasn't looking for an open plan house and an eye level grill. I'd have been happy with a tent and a sandwich toaster. The scrumptious Jan Francis will be joining us to choose her favourite telly memories a little bit later. Now then, every home has an address, and that means town, street or road, and number. I mean, how else would you get your letters? And to make life even easier for the postman, houses get numbered in order. One, two, three, four, five. Except, sometimes, as Alan Wicker discovered on the Old Tonight programme. This is the village of Branch End in Northumberland on the road between Hexham and Gateshead. And this is a Meadowview Terrace, a terrace of ten houses, and we're looking for number five, which is perhaps a little more difficult than you might think. That's number one, and this is number two, and this is number eight, and number eight. One, two, eight. Oh. Well, if that's number eight, and this next one must be number nine. Number three. One, two, eight, three. Well, if that's three, this will be four. Number two. Another number two. Two twos already. Well, then the next one will be number three. Another number three, I suppose. Number one. Number one. Two number one. Well, this will be number two. Number... Four. Well, at least we're getting warm. The next one must be the one we're after, number five. One, two, eight, three. And this is number three. So that's two number threes and two number ones. And an eight got in there somewhere. Anyhow, this will be number four. That was three. This is number two. 
number two. So that's three number twos and two number threes. And this is the last house. Well, this could be almost anything. Just um, think of a number. This is number, you're wrong, this is number one. Isn't Wicker wonderful? Not surprising, he's one of the most imitated reporters on television. Paddington Bear came to life with a little series of stories told by the gentle and concerned voice of Sir Michael Horden. A poor little Paddington's been doing a bit of home improvement, and decorating's a terribly difficult job. Paddington wasn't sure how long it took him to do the wallpapering, but he did discover one thing. Apart from making him hot, it also showed up the ceiling. The ceiling definitely needed whitewashing. Is that you, Paddington? shouted Mr. Brown. Are you all right? cried Mrs. Brown. Yes and no, answered Paddington truthfully. The plain fact was that when he'd started work, there had been a window and a door. Now, there was only a window left. Perhaps you'd better let yourselves in, he exclaimed, wherever you are. I think I must have papered myself in by mistake. Oh, I know the feeling. And if you ever paint a floor, don't forget, never paint yourself into a corner. Have you ever thought how nice it would be to get away from it all? The noise, the pollution, the traffic, the neighbours? Right. Well, one wacky Japanese businessman built a weekend cottage for himself and his family, not in the country, not by the seaside, not even floating on the sea, but somewhere completely out of sight. The only sign of it, the only ripple betraying its existence, is this service boat on the surface of a bay in the Japanese southern sea off the coast of Okinawa. The weekend cottage lies six fathoms below it. They leave the door unlocked during the week. It's that sort of neighbourhood. Anyone can drop in, providing he's got an aqualung and shares Mr. Panaka's passion for the deep. In the entrance hall, fresh air, light, warmth. Visitors are requested to shed their rubber skins in the entrance hall and shower off the salt water. Plumbing is fairly basic, but there's a loo with a view that's unique. In the main room, all the plush comforts of sea level existence. Carpets, armchairs, a bar with subdued lighting, accommodation for up to 12 guests. Back inside, work's already begun on preparing the evening meal. Rice from the mainland, supplemented by a couple of fish plucked from the kitchen garden. Even down here, a rich young businessman can't cut himself off entirely from his responsibilities. That's why Mr. Panaka has had the phone put in. There's also some news from the surface that a storm's blowing up. The local fishermen are pulling up their nets. Mr. Panaka says that the ocean bed of the Pacific is one of the most hospitable places on Earth. It doesn't use up much energy to live down here, and there are many lagoons which could be colonized in the way he's done it. They're shallow, so the pressure isn't too much of a problem. And they're so warm that no heating is necessary. And you never feel the impact of the tropical storms raging up on the surface. What's more, he says, if we are to exploit the mineral resources of the undersea world, we'll need undersea homes. Mr. Panaka's underwater cottage, not the sort of place to get a leaky roof. Can you imagine whole streets of underwater homes? 
Well, they certainly wouldn't look like the streets of Manchester 30 years ago. This piece of film captures the days when little two-up, two-downs were regarded as slums, and there was an open fireplace in every room. I hope you're counting the chimneys. 125, Placed with modern blocks. A lot of people would like to turn the clock back and live in a little brick house again. The people in Only Fools and Horses live in a concrete block, and one of Dell's great wheezes was to get a job in a very big posh house, cleaning chandeliers. Now, chandeliers are incredibly heavy and they're made of hundreds of pieces of cut glass. They have to be fixed through the ceiling by a huge nut and bolt. And when you take them down, you have to be very, very careful. And we pick up the story when Dell and Rodney have the ladders and the blanket, and Grandad is upstairs with the spanner, and everything seems to be ready for the great lowering. What do you think would be the price of a beautiful Georgian townhouse like this? Half a million pounds, maybe even a million pounds. Well, in fact, 575 pounds would be nearer the mark because, in fact, it's a doll's house and a very beautiful one at that. Come inside and have a look with me. It's minute, perfect little details. Look at this stove, for example. It's made of iron. There's the fire door where you take the ashes out in the morning. Next to it, is the oven with its little wire shelves look. And look at the table laid for supper. Yes, sir. Fried egg on toast, a loaf of bread, a great big joint of beef, some salad, chicken, a loaf of bread, and a bottle of wine, some fruit, some sausage rolls down at the end. Gorgeous, isn't it? It's not really a toy. It's a, it's a model. Now, there was one stately home of a doll's house, a little bigger than this one, in the garden of a fairly modest suburban house. And it's home for the most heavily pampered bunch of pooches in the doggy world. Diane Harron met their owner. Maggie, I'm sure it's not a bit normal to have a very fine palace like this in the back garden. How did it all come about? Well, it came about all because of Queen Victoria. Not the Queen, but my little pom. Um, about seven years ago, I had a very small pom, like all of Queen Victoria. And as she was so small, I kept her uh, in a fireplace, which we turned into a room. And she had a little brass bed here. And then we moved, and Queen Victoria unfortunately died. And so I thought, well, I was so upset that I thought, well, I'll have lots and lots of poms, and I won't be so upset again. And so I gradually sort of collected them. And then we, when we came here, we had nowhere to put all the furniture. So we thought suddenly our idea, we'd, we'd have a house built like this and, and to put it all in. And also, I use it, you know, for collecting money for charities. We've got an awful lot of furniture. Where did you get it all from? Well, Queen Victoria had quite a lot um, sent to her. I've got several friends in the antique business, and they, they knew Queen Victoria because she went everywhere with me. And they sent some, and otherwise we've Every time we go out, we see an antique shop, we dash in, hope we find something. It's not actually doll furniture, though, is no, it? No, no, it's antique furniture, and it's um, apprentice pieces. What does that mean? Well, it's uh, small pieces that are made by, by apprentices, I presume. <laughs> So 
when night time comes, all the little princesses know that they can snuggle down safely into their little beds. Time to go to sleep now. Good night, children. Good night. Can you beat it? Now, have a look in here. This is a beautiful little drawing room. If you go right inside with me, you can imagine it's going like going into another world, isn't it? See the pictures on the walls, the little corner cupboard, perfect little details. You'd have to have very small dogs indeed to go in a room that size. But what about a horse? I've heard of horse lovers getting sentimental about their four-legged friends, but this film coming up makes Roy Rogers and Trigger look like the Mutual Hatred Society. Sam? <laughs> Sam is four, and I've had him for six months now. He just loves human beings. He's very, very fond of all of us. And he knows I adore him, and in return, he seems to love me. Oh, uh, hi, Sam. Good to see you. <laughs> but of course, he is a common sort of horse. Sounds rather rude. He's not a thoroughbred. And I wouldn't ask any horse into a house. But he's very placid. So he usually comes in about once a week after lunch when we're all sitting around having coffee in the sitting room. Well, as far as house training is concerned, that's something that we've never consciously taught him. But he hasn't had an accident yet. So we just live in hope. So I have a feeling that the time that he does disgrace himself, that'll be the end of his invitations into the drawing room. I think if we were all as nice to other people as some people are to their pets, the world would be a far happier place. Most seaside towns have a few rows of holiday chalets, not much more than beach huts mostly, where you can stay right on the beach and leap straight into the sea in the mornings. There was one village near Clacton called Jaywick where the chalets were so nice that people started to live in them all the year round. And then, disaster. The council threatened to pull them down. So the residents got out their hammers and nails and brushes and turned them into little stately homes. They were so lovely, the council couldn't pull them down. And they're still there, as beautiful as ever. Some highly individual examples there of how a home should look. But then, how do you make the inside even more comfortable? Well, in the 1950s, there was a great and famous sculptor. Well, he was more of an inventor. Well, in fact, he was a real individualist with imagination and skill who made very silly things that moved. His name was Roland Emmett, and his ideal home had at its heart a device which he called the Emmett Home nucleus. Malcolm Muggeridge asked Emmett to explain it to him. Roland, this is a most Hello, extraordinary contraption, even from you. What's it supposed to be? Well, it's, it's sort of automation in the home. It's a kind of an automatic kitchen, this half of it. Well, where, what are we doing here, for instance? Well, this is the washing up here being done. As you see, no human hand or eye anywhere near. Spin drying across the ceiling and putting it in the cupboard. And what is Roland about which extraordinary beautiful looking bird? Electronic. It's an electronic cooker, this. Uh, under the influence of the 
cuckoo clock, the alarm clock, and the little wristwatch. We've got it absolutely done to a turn. But how do you coordinate the three so that she's done so beautifully? I don't really know. I think it's something to do with radioactivity. But I thought you works. made this machine. Ah, but there are certain things we can't fathom, you know. But you just put the clocks and somehow it works. Well, you hope for the best. It's and a sort of art rather than science, in other words. Well, it's nice of you to put it like that. Anyway, it works. <laughs> And what have we got down here, Ren? And what's this book here? Well, that's a kind of chained Bible, Malcolm. It's, it's Miss, Mrs. Beaton. But if nobody does anything, why do you want to know about the recipes of Mrs. Beaton? Well, there's a, you've got a point there. We never really got around to that. But In other words, it's a formality. Nobody ever really looks at it. I think it must be a formality. I think the whole of this machine is absolutely mad, Ren. Extraordinary. It's amazing what you find behind scenery. Shall I tell you what you find behind scenery? You find the back of the scenery. Come and have a look. Look at this. Look at this terrible old rubbishy plywood with numbers all over it. Look at that. What does it say? Late, late breakfast show. Oh, this is a brace. That's holding the scenery up. This is a stage weight, which keeps everything in place, stops it falling over. That's plywood. This it's even lighter. It's canvas. Scenery has to be very light and portable. Some of it even has to be designed to break or explode or fall over. But this doesn't fall over. And that, the breakaway world of scenery, is this week's look inside television. A program can be made in a day in a studio like this. Now, if someone's going to make another one tomorrow, all this has to be taken out. The special floor paint has to be washed off and then a whole lot of fresh scenery moved into place. And it all happens in about 10 hours, right through the night. Now, the BBC once made a film using a stop motion setting on the camera to compress 10 hours of scene shifting into 45 seconds. It was the change from a play called Cousin Bet to Z Cars. And this was the result. stunts Michael Crawford used to do in Some Mothers Do Have Them. Well, some very special scenery had to be made for him. While he was risking life and limb, the world collapsing around him, the trick scenery had to work, first time, every time. Ooh. Takes a lot of planning and care to make that kind of stunt work properly. Well, so much for the pretend world of television, but what about the gritty business of pulling down real buildings? I suppose if you're a group of martial arts enthusiasts and you've got tired of thumping each other and karateing bits of wood, there's only one way to go. Ah! This derelict three-bedroom house has stood for a hundred years, but members of the East Anglia Martial Arts Club had the muscle power to bring it down. No! The roof and windows had been removed before the attempt on the instructions of an insurance company who insured onlookers against injury. But there was still plenty to tear down. The house consisted of 7,000 bricks. They rapidly got to grips with their task, fortified by nothing stronger than orange juice. This is not karate, but the heaven and thunder fist style of the martial arts. 
A 20 stone enthusiast <laughs> tackling the outside lavatory. <laughs> the local council who owned the house allowed the event to raise funds for the club. It took just over an hour to complete, and the only casualty, a man with a blister. There is a man who explodes buildings for a living. He's a jolly soul who loves regaling audiences with tales of his destructive, daring do, living within an inch of getting a hundred tons of bricks on his head. His name's Blaster Bates, and he's obviously a bit of a lad. I'll pick the phone up, and the chap said, Oh, it's the BBC from Bristol. I said, oh, aye. He said, yes. He said, we hear you knocking three chimney stacks down tomorrow. I said, yes, I am. He said, when are you knocking them down? I said, half past seven in the morning. Then he said, is it light at half past seven? <laughs> he didn't know. I said, I'm not telling you. <laughs> I'm not sure I could tell you if it's light at half past seven in the morning. Well, it must have been that week because the BBC ended up getting some pictures of chimneys ending their days gracefully in a cloud of dust. take long does it the real skill of a demolition man is to be able to position the explosives just right so that the building falls exactly where you want it to you can even make it fall straight downwards look at this We've reached the moment when we look at films made not by television professionals, but by ordinary people who just happen to enjoy taking moving pictures. And we want to show yours. They can be funny, silly, poignant, spectacular, or just tell us something about how life was led long ago. We're starting the ball rolling with a discovery of our own, a film made in the Scottish village of St. Boswells. All we know is that it was shot by the wife of the laird, Lady Sybil Middleton. It evokes a simple style of country life it's very hard to find nowadays. And what's exciting about it is that lots of things haven't changed at all. It's just people in and around their homes just getting on with life. They've probably never seen a film, and it was certainly made long before the invention of television. For one filmmaker, it was all her own work. Next week, it could be yours.
if you've got some films of your own, or even videos if you've shot them yourself, sitting in a cupboard just waiting to be shown, why not send them to us? We'd love to show them. They can be good or bad, silly or sensible, and any gauge of film will be okay. They just have to be all your own work. The address to send them to is Windmill, BBC Television, London W12 8QT. We'll take good care of them, I promise. Just remember to include your name, address and telephone number. House hunting can be a risky business. You never quite know what you're going to get till you see it. Well, when Vince, played by Paul Nicholas, decided to set up home with Penny, played by Jan Francis in Just Good Friends, he tracked down the ultimate pad, and they just couldn't wait to see it. Well, this is it. Good God. <coughs> Looks like the Holiday Inn at Port Stanley. <laughs> well, just come in and get the feel of the place, Pen. I've already got the feel of the place. <coughs> I'm itching. <laughs> All it needs is a bit of work done on it. It's like demolishing and rebuilding. <laughs> They're just first impressions, Pen. Have a look at the kitchen. No, I'm saying myself over there. <laughs> I'd like to see the kitchen, please. Ugh. Robert Carrier, eat your heart out. <laughs> well, it's no use trying to hide it from me, Pen, I can tell. You're unimpressed. <laughs> People actually cooked food in here. Oh, yes, they did cook food in here. <laughs> Well, it could do with a bit of a wiping over. <laughs> it could do with wiping out. Oh, Vince. What's that lying in the sink? Looks like some kind of furry mould. I wonder if it answers to a name. <laughs> Wash it down the sink. No, I'm going to send it for analysis. It might cure something. <laughs> Stay. Well, the star of Just Good Friends is Jan Francis, and she's our guest this week. Jan, was it really as horrible as it looked? Yes, it was. In fact, it was worse than it looked. Television seemed to make things look nicer. It was really revolting. Right. But it did get better. Yes, in the next episode, we'd had it all decorated, and it was all sparkly clean and lovely. Are you a do-it-yourselfer? Um, a bit, yes. I've had to, really. We've moved several times, and um, I quite like getting up a ladder and wielding a paintbrush. Even papering. I even papered ceilings sometimes. My goodness. A bit of a stretch for me. <laughs> I wish I'd known you then. <laughs> sort of thing I could do without a ladder, yes, exactly. Do you remember a name from the past, Barry Bucknell? Yes, I, I do remember the name. Yes. Did you ever see him? Nope, never. Right. I'll tell you about him. Barry Bucknell was television's first ever do-it-yourselfer. He had a regular program in the 1950s in which he gave viewers projects to do. Now, at the time, tapered contemporary legs which stuck out at a funny angle were the very latest thing. Then we can stand it on its legs. Now, I've only just got to put these drawers in, and it's a complete desk, nice piece of furniture, costing around about seven pounds for materials, but you'll get a really nice desk. And I don't think it's as uh, complicated as you may have thought in the beginning. Anyway, that's all from me for this week. So, till I see you again, same time next week. Bye now. like that on television they anymore, do don't. They? I think they ought to. It's yeah, wonderful. Oh, it's a pity. Absolutely. What's your favourite room at home? I think it has to be the kitchen, really. You spend a lot of time in there? Yes. I'm, I quite enjoy cooking, but it's the room that everyone gravitates towards. Right. And they do actually watch me cooking, which makes me a bit nervous, but I do like the kitchen. But you enjoy being in there? Hmm. What's your favourite gadget? I think I'd have to say my food processor. 
wonderful, whizzy thing that does miracles for me. Well, you're going to love this next clip in that case, because back in the dark old days of black and white television, at a time when people didn't have very much money to spare, kitchen gadgets were surprisingly rare. And spindly furniture, like stuff we were looking at just now, was the in thing. Julian Pettifer found some evocative film of the 1952 Ideal Home Exhibition in a program called Seems Like Yesterday. And remember all that old Victorian furniture? Well, we seem to have got away from that all right, and contemporary designs are simple and attractive. Cocktails are a feature of every ideal home, and nowadays you can have a hey presto push button arrangement for drinks. Well, perhaps you could. But domestic appliances were scarce and expensive. Food mixers were demonstrated, but few had yet found their way into the shops. Washing machines, refrigerators, and central heating were rare luxuries. Freezers almost unknown. Eye-level grills were the latest and trendiest additions to the kitchen. The cheapest telly was 125 pounds, and only eight families in a hundred owned one. Today, it's virtually every family. Did you have a television like that when you were little? We didn't have a television for ages and ages. Did you really? No, we felt very deprived because all the other children in the street had one and we didn't have one. Oh. Mm. There were some people who resisted TV for quite a long time, weren't yes, there? Yes, I think they thought it was bad for you or something. And we all know now it's not, don't we? Right. <laughs> what can you remember of 1952, if anything? I know it's a long, long time ago. Very little, really. 1952, I was playing games a lot, really, and that's about all. You were a little, little girl, mm. and I happen to know. We've got a mm. snapshot of you in 1952. <laughs> mm, here it is. Look, in your car. Do you know what sort of car it is? I don't. I think it's a very smart car. Isn't it's it? Wonderful. With pedals, right? Yes. Great. I'd quite like that now. Terrific. <laughs> now, you know those films in which uh, little model creatures mysteriously move around mm -hmm. with no wires or strings visible? Mm -hmm. We've discovered how it's done. I've got a bendy toy here, and this is going back a little bit as well. What they do, they get a film camera that can take one picture at a time, and they bend, well, the whole thing bends, but let me give you an example. Supposing they did that, took a picture of it like that, bent it like that, took another picture, bent it like that, did another picture, like that, took another picture. No, don't do that. Sorry. <laughs> bent like that and so on. If you then take a whole series, hundreds and hundreds of single pictures, and then run them together as a film at speed, you end up with something that looks like almost normal motion. And here's an early example featuring a group of gonks. Some people may remember gonks, some don't, I know. But it's a film of a record which was in the charts for 10 weeks in 1962. Right Said Fred by Bernard Cribbins. Right said Fred, both of us together, one each end and steady as we go. <coughs> Tried to shift it, couldn't even lift it, we was getting nowhere. And so we had a cup of tea and right said Fred, give a shout for Charlie, up comes Charlie from the floor below. After straining, even and complaining, we was getting nowhere. And so we had a cup of tea, and Charlie had a think, and he thought we ought to take off all the handles. And the things what held the candles, but it did no good. Well, I never thought it would. All right, said Fred, have to take the feed off to get them feed off. Wouldn't take a mo. Took its feet off, even took the seat off. Should have got us somewhere, but no. So Fred said, let's have another cup of tea, and we said, right on. All right, said Fred, have to take the door off, need more space to shift the so so. Had bad twinges, taking off the inches, and it got us nowhere. So we had a cup of tea and right said Fred Have to take the wall down, that there wall is gonna have to go <laughs> Took the wall down, even with it all down We was getting nowhere And so we had a cup of tea and Charlie had a think And he said, look Fred, I've got a sort of feeling If we remove the ceiling with a rope or two We could drop the blood through All oh, right, said Fred Climbing up a ladder with his crowbar Gave a mighty blow Was he in trouble? Half a ton of rubble Landed on the top of his dome So Charlie and me had another cup of tea And then we went home I said to Charlie We'll just have to leave it Set it on the landing, that's all 
He's in the trouble with Freddy's. He's, he's too hasty. Now, you never get nowhere if you're too hasty. That must be one of the first ever rock videos, I suppose. <laughs> that, was a, that was a chart popping there. Well, Jan Francis, thank you very much for joining us on Windmill and being such a charming guest today. What's your next project? Well, I'm going to be doing something rather rivaling you, in fact, Chris. I'm what? doing some interviewing. Oh. Yes, I've just done a pilot programme. That's a tryout sort of programme. Uh -huh. And hopefully, I'm going to be doing a series quite soon. Interviewing lots of people? Yes, I might even interview you. Oh, I should be, <laughs> I should be honoured. Anyway, thank you very much. Thank you. Harold Williamson used to interview children, and the results were always charming and revealing. He asked one group about the sort of ideal home they would most like to live in. I'd have, in an island, and I'd have, um, I'd have servants. Uh, I'd have servants doing all the work sometimes. Let them have light days off, Sunday and Saturday, and Monday and Wednesday, something like that. Why would it be on an island? So you can be all by yourself then. Nobody's bossing you around. But I'd have pictures on the wall, two sides of the wall with the lion and the cheetah on, and the two other middle walls, they'd have um, horses and dogs. It would be all animals? Yes, it would be all animals. Why? Because I like animals. And they, well, I just like animals, that's all. <laughs> What about you? Where would your ideal home be? Well, probably under the sea. Uh, round about where there's lots of coral and oysters. Lots of? Coral and oysters. Is it possible to live under the sea? Yes. Well, how would you breathe? Well, it'd be an oxygen tank up in the roof and uh, some pipes coming round to each room. One for the oxygen to come in and one for the uh, used air to go out. But what's wrong with living on land? Too much noise and people bothering you. It's time to go home. Jan Francis to her home, Blaster Bates is going back to his dynamite store, Barry Bucknell to his homemade home, Mr. Panaka to his underwater cottage, and it's time for Andy Pandy and Teddy to go back to their basket. Quick now. And from Windmill, goodbye. Join us next week. Goodbye. Goodbye.
you should be able to explain this to me. How, how long have you been delivering letters here? Just on seven years. Seven ago. years. Well, have you worked out these numbers? Well, it's a difficult job to work out numbers in here. I believe with, you. With there being 12 houses and the number in one to four, three times, which gives you three ones, three twos, three threes, and three fours. Well, they were telling me it was the one with the yellow windows. What number's there? That's number three from your end and number ten from this end. Or it could be number six. But how can it be ten from this end when it's only, what, seven houses away? It's actually it, number eight from this end, number three from yon end, and number three from number one, which is marked in the center number one. So what number is it? Well, that's impossible to come to, isn't it? Well, I'm sorry about this confusion. It obviously is quite straightforward. If um, number eight is the third one from here, and the sixth one is, in fact, number one, five must be the fourth down, uh, or possibly the, the fifth down. Anyhow, I'll find out by trial and error. Well, our next programme this afternoon, States of Mind, follows in a moment. And then at two o'clock, Rugby Special features London Welsh versus the touring Fijians. The start of the final in the Championship Bowling is at 2.30. And then at 4.45, Mitsuko Uchida plays Mozart's final piano concerto in B-flat, written the year he died at the age of 35, the age of this afternoon's performer. The subject of democracy is discussed in Thinking Aloud by Professor Jerry Cohen, Dr. Richard Tuck and Oliver Todd with Brian McGee. That's at 5.20 and takes us up to News Review with Moira Stewart at 6.00.